hello! As the title says, this is my February reading wrap-up, even though March is basically almost over. Quick announcement before I get started, we have started a Snark Squad book club over in our Discord. We've done a few group reads on our Discord before, but those were all a little bit more scattershot, and so now we're trying something a bit more structured. This month we are reading The Golden Compass slash Northern Lights by Philip Pullman. Mari made an actual announcement video that I will link in the description, as well as a link to the Discord server itself so that you can join us. Obviously this month is almost over, but people have been kind of picking up the book like throughout the month, so like the conversation is still happening if you would like to join that, or you can join us next month when our book will be Daisy Jones and the Six by Taylor Jenkins Reid. Okay, so February. This was a slightly less productive reading month for me than January was. It started out really well, and then I don't know, mid-month I like hit a wall where I couldn't focus on anything and my completionist tendencies wouldn't let me DNF anything or save it for later, so like the back half of the month I didn't really finish anything. The first book that I read in February was Year of Yes by Shonda Rhimes. I think that I put this on hold at the library because of the By the Book episode that it was in. Uh, I like super love By the Book as a podcast, and so I will link that in the description. This is a nonfiction book about, as the title suggests, a year in which Shonda Rhimes said yes to everything and the impact that that choice had on her as a person and her life. I assume that people know this, but just in case, Shonda Rhimes is the creator of Grey's Anatomy, Scandal, How to Get Away with Murder, Private Practice, uh, and of course my personal favorite Shonda Rhimes credit, writer of Crossroads. She is of course an amazing writer, so this book was super engaging. Uh, I listened to the audiobook, which Shonda narrates herself. Uh, generally speaking, nonfiction read by the author is great, like generally speaking, there's asterisk on that, but uh, it, in particular with a book with a tone as conversational as this one, it just winds up feeling like you're in a very one-sided conversation with your best friend, the author. This book is a little bit memoir, a little bit self-help, though I think that it is at its strongest when it sticks to the former. Um, the parts where she veers into generalizations are, I think, the weakest parts of the book, but she doesn't do that much of that. And even in the more self-helpy places, she's very open and honest about the privileges and resources that she has. For example, she is a single mother, but she's also a single mother with the means and resources to hire an amazing nanny. And like those two facts in combination have a really strong impact on the kinds of things that she's able to say yes to in the first place. This was a quick, heartfelt, and engaging read, and I gave it four out of five stars. Book number two was Brown Girl Dreaming by Jacqueline Woodson. This is another memoir, this time a middle grade memoir told in verse. Woodson is the author of a bunch of other YA novels, but this is the story of her childhood and moving around and the process by which she found her love of writing. There's so much wonderful stuff here about her relationship with her siblings, which I am always a sucker for, and uh, her relationship with her grandparents and like race in all of the places that she was living. Uh, the family moved from Ohio to the South to New York City. Also, some of how she talks about moving around as a child affected me in ways that I was not entirely prepared for, but like loved. I super appreciated that this was told in verse, the writing was fantastic, uh, and I loved this book to pieces, would highly recommend to anyone, and I gave this five stars. The third book that I read in February was The Underground Railroad by Colson Whitehead. This is a work of historical fiction set in the American South during slavery, where the Underground Railroad is imagined as a like literal underground railroad. The story is mostly about a woman named Cora who was born into slavery and her escape from slavery. There are also some chapters focusing on Cora's mother Mabel, um, a fellow slave named Caesar, a slave catcher named Ridgeway, uh, possibly somebody else that I'm forgetting right now, but this is mostly Cora's story and we kind of zoom in on these other characters as their stories weave in and out of hers. This book is incredible and very worthy of the hype surrounding it. It's like definitely a hard read, but truly fantastic. It was gripping and so well written. Um, I liked the fact that the actual railroad was more of a background presence. It's such an interesting concept that I could see the urge to focus on it a little bit too much, but ultimately this is a story of like all of these people and how their lives are woven together. I don't know what else I have to say about this book besides it was great and I gave it five stars. Next I read Emma by Jane Austen for a Snark Squad pod episode. It is entirely possible that this is the thing that like broke my reading for the month because like revisiting an old favorite uh, you sort of like crawl back into that cozy place and then you want to stay there. This is the story of Emma Woodhouse, a wealthy young woman who thanks to being mistress of her father's house is like not at all interested in getting married herself but also she likes the idea of setting up other people. She meddles in other people's lives and she's wrong all the time and eventually realizes that in addition to being wrong about everybody else she's also wrong about herself. So this is my favorite Jane Austen novel. I have way too many thoughts on this book. We filled the whole hour 
long podcast episode on it and I will link that in the description. We actually also talked about a bunch of Emma adaptations, but I, the part of why this is my favorite Jane Austen novel is that I think of this book as the one that taught me how to read and enjoy and appreciate Jane Austen. I mentioned this in greater detail in the podcast episode, but the snark in Austen's narration in Emma is like what helped me get Jane Austen. It's the book that really taught me how to read her work. She's just really funny and I love her narration and I love Emma Woodhouse. Um, I love that this book is mostly about Emma growing up. Like this is Emma's coming of age story in a lot of ways. Most of her problems are of her own making, which is like hashtag relatable. I also adore the romance in this book because it's essentially just two old friends realizing like, hey, wait, I like you most of all. And there's something very sweet and real about that. I appreciate that these two people have such a clear eyed view of each other's strengths and weaknesses. And rather than a sort of, wow, you're perfect lust, this is a very deeply felt, I know you better than anyone and I love you and appreciate the like the totality of who you are. I have so many more things to say about this. It is a permanent five star read for me and you should listen to our podcast episode about it. The last two books that I finished in February were Daring Greatly and Rising Strong, both by Brene Brown. I read Rising Strong late last year and I loved it. So I bought Daring Greatly like with the idea that at some point I would read that before rereading Rising Strong. Brene Brown is a researcher who studies shame and vulnerability and she's probably best known for her TED talk, um, which I will link in the description because it's a really good primer on her work. So both books are about the need for vulnerability and how we deal with shame. Daring Greatly is sort of um, go forth with vulnerability and then Rising Strong is um, okay, but what about when I do that and then I fuck everything up and then I feel real bad. And I think it's that like ladder framing that makes Rising Strong feel more useful to me. Like her central premise is about the value of vulnerability. And I think that that is much harder to do and also like kind of more important um, when you're in a darker place. And, and so the, I think the larger framing device works better in Rising Strong that it doesn't daring greatly. Something that has stuck with me a ton from my first read um, is committing to the belief that everyone else is trying their best. And I feel so silly when I try to explain it. Like I, I have tried to bring this up in conversation with other people many times and I cannot do it as effectively or as eloquently as Brene Brown does. Um, but I think about it all the time. Um, not because I'm super great at actually adhering to that, but uh, because I think that when I'm trying to, I'm like actively making my life better. There's also some really interesting stuff in Daring Greatly about uh, vulnerability and oversharing and public disclosure, like the sort of intersection of all of those things. And I think that that is super useful for anyone, but particularly for those of us who are extremely online. There's a ton to say about both of these books. Uh, again, if you know nothing about Brene Brown, I do highly recommend uh, checking out her TED Talks. Um, I gave Daring Greatly four stars and Rising Strong five stars. So that is what I read in February. Hopefully I will make a video about this month's reading in a more timely fashion. Please let me know in the comments if you read any of these books and want to talk about them because I would love to talk about these books more than what I just did. Also, hopefully I will see some of you in our Discord to talk about The Golden Compass and or Daisy Jones and The Six. Okay, bye!